So we are now on to topic two. <coughs> now this AMA program runs in universities, uh, many in Australia, also around the world. And in the university, uh, because it runs, each course runs over 39 hours yes, of, of time, uh, the students are asked to read some of the readings and make presentations of those readings for a grade, a class participation grade. So obviously because of the intensive age of this course, you are not going to have that. But everything else, from the case studies to the presentations, they are all exactly the same as the university course. So, and for those who are doing an exam, and I'll talk more about examinations as we go along, um, then you really need to do those readings. They are a choice of the latest readings in the area that are presented for you there. Okay, so we are going to move on to topic two. It's exactly the same as topic one. You will turn and come to the course outline, uh, course no notes. <coughs> so now we are going to get into the manufacturing area. Now I know that many of you are not from manufacturing, but you will see that many of these things we are going to talk about started in manufacturing, but they very soon went to other parts of the business. So although I'm talking about the manufacturing, you see that these are really principles and philosophies that we can use throughout the organization uh, as well. So there's really the organizations. Now, all organizations really have two important subsystems. Two subsystems that are required to satisfy consumer needs. Unfortunately, accounting is not one of them. The two subsystems are first marketing. Marketing determines the need customers want and transfers that which satisfies it to the customer. If you look at customer needs, and if it is a product or a service or anything else, then marketing transfers that to the customer. The other is manufacturing. And manufacturing, of course, makes what has to be transferred. So producers, what has to be transferred? So if it's a product, of course, it's straightforward manufacturing. But you will see that other places, we do what seems to be like manufacturing, but it may not happen in the manufacturing department. You can see that there has to be a very, very good relationship between the two for organizational success. It's no point the customer needing something if manufacturing is unable to produce it with the level of quality required. OK, so production management. Now, when you're going to do marketing in this, uh, the topic two of the second course, you've been doing marketing and the four means of marketing. Some of you have already done it in your BA. And the four means of marketing are product, price, promotion, and place. Similarly, there are five P's of production. And the first one, the same as in marketing, the product. So when I say product, for some of your organization, that will be the service that you're providing. It is not sufficient that the custom consumer requires the product. Organization must be capable of making. Thus, production and marketing must be agreed on product policy. This includes the product's performance, the aesthetics, quality. So if I take a simple thing like this wireless mouse over here, the performance, how many times do I have to press and what sort of laser pointer does it have and so on? How does it look? The level of quality required for this? Not only that, the quantity, selling prices, delivery dates, they are all part of the product policy. And there has to be good agreement between marketing and production. Second P is plant and equipment. Okay. This was best the needs of the product, the market, the operator, and the organization. Now, a little later, in about an hour's time, I'm going to get you all to start making a product. Okay. The simulation exercise. And I'm going to give you your plant and equipment in the form of staplers and hole punchers and scissors and so on. These are your plant and equipment that you're going to be using. So production manager, you're concerned with future demand because the size of your equipment will be very much depending on your future demand, the design and layout of buildings, and also the equipment's performance, reliability, and maintenance, and of course, increasingly these days, <coughs> the aspects of safety. Okay, now in Australia, 
It is a criminal offence, not a civil offence, but a criminal offence. If the board of directors has not taken adequate safety precautions that they are supposed to take to safeguard the workers. And if the worker dies, it's a criminal offence, like a murder. Okay? So it is quite a serious matter these days, safety. In China, you saw that a country that we often thought they didn't care very much about the safety of their, of their workers. Uh, a mining disaster about maybe four or five years ago, okay, which came to the attention of the world, the entire management team, board of directors, was executed. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it is interesting how these things are now to be taken very seriously. Of course, unfortunately, in countries like India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh, not enough is done in this area of safety. We had a recent case of a Bangladesh uh, uh, factory where the doors were locked. And when the factory caught fire, everyone perished. Okay, so even the smallest organization in Australia, for example, this ICMA office in Australia, we cannot, there are only four or five uh, entrances that you can have to get off a place, maybe the main entrance and a few others. Uh, you have to make sure that every one of those entrances, people can run out uh, if there's a fire. So there are special locks and all of these required. Okay, not the case in that unfortunate Bangladesh factor. Okay, so these are important aspects that are coming about. The third P is the process. So how the product is made, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more later. So for the moment, let's look at it as job production batch production, flow production, and just-in-time production. So I'll talk more about that later. But please note that job production is not the same as job costing. Okay? You see that there is a difference. So more about process later. The fourth P is your programs, your logistics. Okay? Timetables and schedules for materials purchasing, manufacturing, parts, <coughs> tools, packing, transport, and of course, for all of these things, you need cash, so you have to have the cash flow requirements. So that means there's a huge amount of scheduling and planning and logistics. Now, it is no accident that I'm at the moment talking to you all, because my time had to be free, the airline schedules had to be free, the hotel had to be free, you all had to be free, the material and everything had to be brought on time for you all to have. All of that required timetables and schedules. So even though this is not a manufacturing exercise, you can see that these are important. And lastly, the last P is people. Now for a long time, marketing didn't have people, but these days they talk about people like brand loyalty and so on. But people have been always important in manufacturing and service organization. Motivating large numbers of men and women. Working conditions same, I mentioned that already. And increasingly, <coughs> some countries, such as Australia, and USA and UK trade unions, They're very, very highly unionized. Okay, of course, last week we had the union bash, the key union bash in Dai, and Maggie Thatcher, okay, who really took on the union, the mining unions of England and won. Okay, and that's the reason why the British public has virtually got divided in half. Do they think it's a great thing that she died, or are they very sad that she died? Okay, so. There's a song from a movie called Wizard of Oz, called Hey, Hey, the Witch is Dead. Okay, that has gone to number one in the hit parade in England. That's the most requested song. Okay, so maybe this is the thing to play because it's a terrible song. Okay, anyway, you can see that these unions can be quite powerful, and you need a powerful person like uh, Thatcher to break them up. Okay, so these are the five pieces of production. <coughs> now you have. <coughs> The, back to the process that I told you, first one is job production. The whole project is considered as one operation and work is completed on any, on each project or product before passing on to the next. That is job production. So used in single one-off products such as printing a newspaper or a book, building a bridge, a dam, where specialized equipment is required. Now I know that many of you, some of you are in manufacturing, but many of you are not. So what I'm going to do is to write, show you the basic characteristics of job production, and then give you a simple example that you could all understand this. So first of all, the characteristics. Single complete unit manufactured by an operator or group. Projects are proceeding in parallel. 
Labor tends to be versatile and highly skilled. Capital equipment investment is high with low utilization. Control is relatively simple, and value is added rapidly. So let's now take an example of this from where production takes place in your home. I'm not talking about the bedroom. I'm talking about the kitchen. Okay. So let us say that you and your partner wants to make a sandwich. Each one a different sandwich. You want to make a cheese sandwich, and your partner wants to make a vegetable sandwich. Okay. So you can see a single complete unit is manufactured by operator or group. You manufacture your cheese, and your partner manufactures the vegetable sandwich. Projects are proceeding in parallel. You don't have to look at each other's projects. Labor tends to be versatile and highly skilled. So what do you need? You need to be able to take the bread out, do the buttering, to put the cheese, to close it, cut it in half and do the edges and whatever. All those skills you have to have. And your partner has to have the same. Capital investment is high with low utilization. Let us take the butter knife. Okay, once you finish putting the butter, you can keep it aside. Your partner uses their butter knife. So you can see two butter bowls, two butter knives, but once you finish buttering, they are idle. Okay, so you can see you have to have high investment of lots of equipment, but low utilization. Now you saw a very good example of this in Dubai, <coughs> some years after the GFC, all that capital equipment or the cranes and so on left idle, okay, because you needed a crane in every location and only for certain times of the day. <coughs> Okay, luckily I can see that they seem to be operating a little bit more these days. Control is relatively simple. You have complete control over your sandwich. No one can interfere with it. And therefore value is added rapidly from start to finish, from taking the bread out to eating the sandwich, very quick uh, value added for both you and your part. So that's job production. Now let's contrast that against batch production. Now batch production is when you're having a party and you want to make 300 cheese sandwiches. Okay. So in this case, the, um, I guess it's too disturbing, not that noise, but it's been the videos. Anyway, um, in this case, you call a lot of your friends to help you to make those sandwiches. So you tell someone, you can see here, the work on any product is divided into parts or operation, and each operation is completed throughout the whole batch before the next operation is undertaken. So you tell some of your, one of your friends, you do the buttering, you put the cheese, you do the cutting, okay, and what they will do is they will butter, say, six slices of bread, and then they pass it on to the next person, who put the cheese, pass it on to the next person, and so on. So these six slices, becomes a batch. So now it sounds good, because you can do a large volume very quickly. You can see concentration of labor skills. So the butter guy is all the time buttering. Okay, he has no other job but to butter. Right? Other person has no other job but to put the cheese. Capital investment is low use due to high plant utilization. Only one butter knife all the time being used. No waiting, okay? no idle time. So that is typical of batch production. Now this, of course, looks fantastic, especially when you want to do large volumes. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that there is something called waiting time. Waiting time. Because once you butter the first slice and you leave it till the batch is finished, that slice is waiting without any value addition. Okay? So that's the first waiting time. Then when you finish the batch, you take the whole lot and give it to the next person. That person is still working on the previous batch, so now the whole batch is waiting. So you can see there's two waiting times. Now what's wrong with waiting time? Let's look at that. Let's take a typical balance sheet. I'm going to give it in T-account format. <clears throat> so we have the financing side here. The financing side. Okay. The 
financing side and the investment side. So, an organization initially starts by wanting finance. <coughs> so it gets this through going to shareholders, and that is called equity. Let us say that is 200, and they go to the banks and so on, and borrow money. That's called debt, let us say 100. So now they have total capital of 300. <clears throat> now they don't just borrow money from shareholders and debt holders and just wait. They use the money for investments. So the investment <coughs> would be in <coughs> fixed assets, called these days non-current assets. Say so we invested say 150 fixed assets and the balance you need for working capital And the working capital would be your inventory, called stock, your accounts receivable, called debtors, your cash, and less <coughs> your current liabilities, like accounts payable or creditors. So that would be another 150, which means that the balance sheet balances. Okay, so that's a typical. <coughs> balance sheet. Now the question is, what sort of assets should we buy? Well, that depends on the money, cost of your money. So let us say, for example, that your equity okay, is 10% cost and your debt is 5%. Now later on in the course, in the second course, I'll be showing you how these are calculated, but for the moment, let's assume that these are the figures. So what you will do is, you calculate your WAC, weighted average cost of capital. The weighted average cost of capital is that you use the weightage of the amount of money. So 10%, 2 upon 3, would be your weight, weighted cost of your equity, plus 1 third of 5%. <coughs> is roughly about 8%. So that's your WAC. You see that it'll be somewhere in between here, depending on the weightage factor here. Between 10 and 5 would be your 8%. So as long as your assets <coughs> earn 8% or more, you will be okay. So you'll be making investments here using this as your cost of capital, as the hurdle rate, example. Okay, so where does that come into this rest period. Well, rest period is inventory, namely working process. So you can see very clearly that if inventory goes up, you need money to finance an inventory, so your cost will be higher. So the lower the inventory, ideally zero, would mean lower financing. So this is a big issue, okay? The cost of running the business is Definitely linked to the financing of those, the money. Now, some of you might say, no, no, our company has no financing because it's all equity. Equity is not free. You see that equity, the shareholders want a return. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you're an all equity company, you still have to have a return to your shareholders. So ideally, if we can get rid of rest periods and lower the inventory, our cost will reduce and will be more efficient. So management account implication would be that idle time is rest period but they value. And we have a thing called process costing. Let me look at the working process costing buffer area. I'm not going to do process costing. You've done enough of that when you're studying cost accounting. But basically, that's the way we do it. But my point is, it's not the costing of that that's important, but trying to get this inventory down to close to zero. Right. So. <coughs> In terms of looking at the process flows, you can see that different individuals or groups, you, your partner, etc., does all the operations, and you get the finished product here. While in batch production, each group does their operation and passes the batch on to the next. 
So for example, there will be waiting time at the time that the first unit is finished in this operation. And also before it is taken up by the second group. So that two waiting times. And that would be under batch production. So as I told you, ideally, if you can remove this waiting time and make this a straight line that goes straight down like this, you'll have the benefits of quick value addition. At the same time, you can do very high volumes. Okay? So high volumes without waiting time. Is that possible? Yes, it is. And it is called flow production. Okay, so flow production has been with us for a long time. And it is essentially <coughs> Henry Ford who developed this process. See, we have a problem still. Okay. So Henry Ford basically looked at an operation like this, where your suppliers, your suppliers came and supplied these to a raw material store, and you took it off the truck. You check the quality, you put it onto the raw material shelves, and when it is required, you took it out of the shelves, put it on a forklift truck, and brought it to the production floor. And then it was on a conveyor belt. So you had various people working on it, on the products, and you even had the quality inspector, part of the operation in the, on the production floor. And then when it was finished, the goods went to a finished goods store. <coughs> and then once the finished goods are built up, it was sold to the customer. So what Henry Ford did was not go much over here and over there in the finished goods, but he reduced the working process time. Not really Henry Ford, but his production engineer who went and saw how they were uh, doing the cutting of carcasses of meat, okay, in an abattoir, where the carcass went round on a conveyor belt and various parts of the animal were sliced up for, for consumption. And he said, ah, they can do it in abattoir, can we do this for cars? And they developed the concept of flow production. So these are the concepts. With proper line balancing, the rest periods of bad production are eliminated and the process in materials is continuous and progressive, so it's a straight line. Basic requirements is a continuity of demand. You can't start doing this if you don't have a customer buy because there'll be too much of finished goods. Standardized product. Okay, it's really no variation at all. The original product that was made by Henry Ford was called the Model T Ford. Okay, and some of you have heard the famous saying, and before told the customers, you can have any color that you want as long as it's black. So even no color variation. Okay? Now why black? Because he found that black was the only paint at that time <coughs> that could dry in this one process time. Other paints would be all to dry. He said, you can have any color that you want as long as it's black. But later on, General Motors and so on gave a little bit of cause variety or false variety by having different colors at the finish stage. Material must meet the specification, the delivered on time. All operations must be defined. At the same time, and remain constant. All stages must be balanced. <coughs> Work must, perform, must conform to quality standards. What if it doesn't? What if work does not conform to quality standards? Well, what they do is, if the inspector here, Then it's not very good. It is taken aside either as a rework. In other words, it can come down here to fix the problem, or it may be impossible to rework it, and it becomes what is called yield loss, which is really scrapped. So it is sold for scrap. Okay, so these are what happens. 
the important thing here in flow production is that the, the belt must never stop. The conveyor belt must never stop. The conveyor belt must go on, and you just take these things aside to be reworked or a scrap. Okay, so in the old days, people used to go mad. Why? They were doing the same job over and over again, and you know, they were essentially no variation at all, no stoppages. So there's a Charlie Chaplin movie that came out at that time. At that time, it was called Modern Times, okay, where Charlie Chaplin was a man who had to tighten a wheel. The whole day he was doing this. So when he walked home also, he was walking like this, and at home, okay, with the wife also, he was like this all the time, okay? These guys were mad. So what did they do? Those days, those spanners were very big spanners for those huge bar nuts and bolts. They took the spanner and they put it into the cockpit, and the whole operation stopped. So this is why the term that some of you have come across in the English language called spanner in the works is to really mess up the whole thing. That actually came from fuel production, where they put the spanner to stop the production line. They were going crazy. Okay, so later on they do other things to make people behave rational. Anyway, going back to the process, the inspection must be in line, we've talked about that. Sorry, maintenance must be by anticipation, not by difficulty. <coughs> so specific maintenance times. Inspection must be in line with production located within the flow and not occupy more than one operational unit. Advantages, direct labor content reduced due to economies of time. Okay, so this is the start of the process of change in organizations, where before this happened, you had an organization to take its total cost. A large part of the cost was direct labor cost. And a small part was indirect overhead. But now, the start of the process of where they were changing was that this direct labor component reduced and the indirect component increased. Okay? So that was the start, but today, and I've been talking about this more and more, what has happened in today's business, not just because of flow production, but other reasons, indirect costs. on the largest part of cost, and the direct cost is very small. So if you have allocation systems that were okay here, where you allocate the indirect cost using a large amount of direct level, is okay. But nowadays, we're still having the same allocation system to allocate the large amount of indirect cost, the small amount of direct cost, you make those allocation systems completely inaccurate. So that's what we're going to leave for. Okay, next is reproduce <coughs> for the product, hence the accuracy is high, we have very much standardization. Inspection in line and deviation from standard quickly picked up. In fact, you will see, even when you do our simulation game, that you don't have to need accounting to know that there's a problem with the flow, because if you go into the factory and the reworks are piling up, the strap is piling up, you know that the problem is the production flow. You don't have to look at any reports. Working process at the minimum, which is good, because the working process at the minimum means that our costs are reduced. Control is simplified, the flow line being virtually self-controlling. This includes production, quality, budgetary, and supervisory control. Weaknesses in methods and materials are immediately highlighted. As I told you, it's very visual. You can go and see what's happening. Material requirements can be planned more accurately. Investment in materials more rapidly translated into income from sales. It becomes that diagonal straight line. Okay, so examples of this would be motor cars, large and medium scale, and watches, mobile phones, etc. Medium to small case production can be done using flow production techniques. Okay, now let's move on to look at other production terms in general use. Now some people talk about continuous production, those in the oil industry that I heard over here, do this. 
24-7, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Production, implies flow production, very high volume, and very, very capital intensive. Oil refinery, that would be never stopping, continuous production. Then we have customized production. Production done only against the customer's orders and not for stock. Does not include, indicate any type of method. So you simply make a product to what the customer wants. So there are Rolls Royce cars that are made with a bed inside or a toilet inside. These are customized. But for the best customized examples comes from this part of the world. One of your rulers uh, or businessman has got a, a silver <coughs> Audi where every single part is made out of silver. Not silver plated, but actual silver. Okay, and an A380 <coughs> for themselves. First of all, I think of an A380 with the gold thrown in the, in the A380 itself. Those are customized to a specific customer requirements. Okay. And then we have mass production. This is simply the production done on a large scale. <coughs> May it be doing job, and you can have a very, very large job production or batch production, but most likely mass production would be these days using flow techniques. Okay, so have a look at this. Customize means <coughs> a single custom order. Mass means large scale. So can you have mass customization? In other words, large volumes are made but every unit is unique. Is it possible? Sounds impossible. But it is possible, <coughs> and it is through what we call FMS, Flexible Manufacturing System. Okay. Not possible during Henry Ford's time, but definitely possible today. <coughs> so, what are the characteristics of the FMS system? It's an integrated system for the automatic processing of a wide variety of work units through various workstations. Key elements in FMS are automated material handling, computer controlled workstations, and a network of supervisory computers. Each product is unique. Now the best example of this is Dell computers. They are using Dell quite a lot. Because what happens in Dell? You go to their website, doesn't no matter what country you are from, you choose exactly the computer you want, the CPU, the hardware, all of that you can choose. And then you give your credit card details and production of your computer starts. Now if I give the order in Australia, production starts in Malaysia. Can I get my computer in 48 hours? Right. Why is that? Because they are able to, in the manufacturing process, they can change the CPUs and all of that exactly to your specification. So they make a large volume of computers per day, but each one is unique. That is because of flexible manufacturing systems. Now, an American professor went to Japan when his FMS system started in Japan, and he came back and reported that he was so scared because he said he went to the manufacturing floor of one of these Japanese companies, and the entire factory had only one employee, the security guard. Okay, everything else was computer controlled. Okay. He said the only thing that he was happy was was that his network of supervisory computers were all American computers. That's the only thing that gave him a little bit of pleasure, but he saw the future with okay, these FMS systems. So FMS system can be characterized by extremely short setup times, ability to process many variants of a single product and the capacity to make rapid extensions to the existing product line. So these days, if you go to say Honda, <coughs> you see on the production line, you have a Honda Accord, followed by a Honda Civic, followed by an Integra. Okay, all of these, the computer can immediately switch from one car to another instantly. So the setup time is very, very fast. The batteries are usually very small. Say one, can have a size of only one product, like in Dell to 20 pieces of the same part of product. As a result of FMS, many firms have successfully adopted multi-variety, that is customized, high volume, 
that is mass productive. So mass customization. If it has a radically changed manufacturing strategies in many companies. Okay, so of course, you as an accountant has to think about how much of money you would invest in the system, system, and this is where the problem starts. <coughs> No, no, no. In fact, you may hope that you have no inventory at all. Because remember the Dell computer, once it is manufactured, it is immediately sent out. Right? So we talk about that. Okay, in fact, you will ideally like no inventory at all. In other words, we'll be talking about this later, you only make for order. Okay? Only when you receive an order, you make the product. So there's no inventory of finished goods. <coughs> that also is a good question. Should you have a large inventory of raw material? We'll talk about that as well. Ideally, no. Okay, in fact, the only inventory, ideally, would be just that last hour of production of a, say, a dead computer that you start manufacturing at 4.30 and you haven't finished yet by 5 o'clock and you go home, that inventory will be there for the day, but next morning it's finished. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that we talk about. Good question. Very good question. Please ask questions like this. Huh? So front-end cost, that is the investment in these, okay? The front-end cost, <coughs> the investment is very high. We're talking about large amounts of robotics, computers, and so on both in plant and also programming time. We need lots and lots of computer programmers to do all the programs. These programming and software costs are actual investments and should be capitalized. Okay, so not only the actual fixed asset, but the programming time should be capitalized. But what do we do because of IFRS? We are told that the programmer salaries should be expensed in a particular year. But IFRS allows us to capitalize legal costs. So if you have to spend money to get lawyers to do contracts to buy these assets, IFRS says that's okay to capitalize. But the programmer that we use to program these machines to make our production, they say no, that is an expense item. Now we are not going to go and talk about IFRS, but in management accounting, for our management accounting purposes, we actually would be taking these sorts of program and software costs as capital items to be capitalized. And we have to get a return on them. Most often they are regarded as periodic expenses or expense, <coughs> in which case they contribute to the practice of inadvertently subsidizing low volume and penalizing high volume products. Okay, so what happens is that when you have a new product, these expenses are often allocated to the production that you already have of the current range of products and you will find, and you can, I usually have lots of examples of this, of wrongly allocated costs. The advantages go far beyond these considerations. <coughs> Thus, SOMS plans are real, and related software programming costs should be instead included as strategic investments or capitalized. What are the benefits of an FMS system? In many cases, FMS investments are justified not by cost savings, but by the intangible benefits that they that are crucial for long-term competitiveness. The company has to automate or die. So if you're an accountant, you say, oh, this is too expensive. Plant costs are too expensive, programming costs are too expensive. They start invest. Fine, you save that money, but you go so quickly out of being a competitor with the other that you will be dying anyway. So automate or die. The intangible features of FMS should be highlighted when justifying FMS investments. Just don't do it after the value calculation and say let's not invest. Reasons to adopt FMS can be grouped into five broad categories. So these are examples of what you will be doing to justify spending this money. There are cost reasons, <coughs> something we just discussed. Low inventory levels, I'll show you in fact that you can Reduce RM from the stores to zero or finish this to zero and very little of inventory here. That is immediate point of impact on your financing. Reduce labor costs. Reduce scrap and rework. So not so much scrap and rework because no, no sort of 
errors on the production floor, reduce floor space. You don't have to have safety features and uh, safety things for the workers to walk when they don't get hurt and so on because it's all machines there. So there are cost reasons. There is time reason. Reduce time between product design, change, and the manufacturing of a new design. Reduce throughput time to facilitates make go order production and short delivery time. Now, an example that I'll show you in a minute, what we can discuss now, is the case of the Lexus motor car. Okay, when Lexus came out, the European car manufacturer said, ha, you know, it's another Toyota. Okay, they will never be able to match our standards. They got a shock because the Lexus was better than the Mercedes Lexus and all that, the first Lexus that came. Okay, that was shock number one. Shock number two was that they were able to come out with a new model every five years. The Mercedes Benz came out with a truly new model, not a facelift, every seven years. Okay, so they had that advantage, time to market advantage as well. So you can see that they were able to do this because of flexible manufacturing systems. So this is the, what I said, marketing reasons, quicker introduction of new and modified products and the build to make rapid changes in the product mix and volume. You can rapidly increase the volume or reduce it because of this flexible manufacturing system. So there are good marketing reasons. Quality reasons, increased first time yield, not so much as scrap can be work, high consistency in quality levels. And technology reasons, the use of advanced technology is an investment in knowledge that can be used in the future to develop and manufacture more advanced products than those of company goods. So these are the intangible reasons that go beyond simply natural and value calculation when you try to justify these investments. Other, even more intangible effects can be classified as follows. Volume flexibility, the ability to adjust rapidly to temporary volume increases at a low cost. This ability is attractive to customers. Parts and product flexibility, the flexibility to produce a large variety of products, so you permit customer production and reduce inventory. In fact, we look at Japanese cars across the board, your Toyotas, your Hondas, your Mazdas, they all seem to have similar components. The air conditioning knob looks the same, the various volume control for the radio looks the same. That's because of part and product flexibility. Now, I don't know if it has been happening in UAE, but last week, there was a recall of, I think, uh, cars be between certain period, 2002 and 2006 or something, of Hondas, Mazdas, Toyotas, but they are there. They did not deploy. Was it done here as well? Okay? Yeah, last week. They are there before, right? Across all different manufacturers. Why? Because of this flexibility that is. Innovation flexibility, the ability to produce new generations of product at a low cost. Okay, so these are, all this gives important competitive advantage since it allows the company to maintain a rapid pace of product introductions. Coming out with a new, genuinely new product all the time. Besides these important intangible benefits, FMS can also dramatically alter cost structures. So here, once again, we have this increasing pressure on direct costs and <coughs> increases in direct costs. <coughs> because all those programmers, all those, uh, the depreciation of the machines, all that is indirect costs, shared amongst many production services, and your direct costs are reducing. The Japanese company I men mentioned had only one employee, and that person also was indirect because they shared amongst all the products. So you find the cost structures changing like this. Direct level replaced by indirect level. Program then able to support and control the automated machines. Engineering work on new products and qualification increases. This increases due to the shorter product lifetime and increase of variety. Administration of components and products increases because you have so many colors, so many components. Okay, you need people to administer that. So once again, indirect cost. Okay, so all of this means that your cost structures have changed. And if the cost structures have changed but our cost accounting system has not changed, then we are going to be giving our managers the wrong information. Okay, so that's something that we're building up to. Okay, so that is three of the methods, job, batch, and flow. 
and also the use of flexible manufacturing system. Now let's have a little bit of fun, but let's do some production simulation game. Shakib and Jaffa, we are going to start the game now. So what you're going to get is to make a product. Okay, I'm going to give you all the specifications. And however, I'm going to keep the product. The product that you're going to make is like this. You have to make it exactly according to the product specification that you see over here. But I'm going to leave the product on the table here. Okay, so only one member of your group is allowed to come here and take whatever measurements they want and go and communicate it back to the group. And please, don't take the product back to the group. You'll be instantly disqualified. Okay? So one of you will be your production designer. Right? And the product is product A, which you will be making. Uh, there are five groups here. So although it says here 20 units, we'll make it 25 units. Okay, and you're going to get $500 per unit. That is each one of these, we give you $500 when you sell it to me and the customer. And the level of quality is medium. Now you have to figure out what medium means, right? Demand is 25 and uh, the batch size is five. Then you can't sell it to me until you make five of these. Once you make five, you can bring. So obviously there's some waiting time after you make the first one till you get the five to set it to me. Okay? So you'll be having some information on the board here. Remember the prices of raw materials and so on can go up or down. I'll be giving you announcements about that the price is going up or down. Okay? And so on. So keep an eye on the market information. And you have about 45 minutes to make the products. Okay, so now you understand the difference between what I meant by quality, for medium quality. I looked at one of the batch and I checked it, and if one was okay, I accepted the whole batch. For B, I checked individually, okay, and I did return a product which they had used the, the, the ruler to do the cutting rather than the scissors. And product C, I don't know from where you all found out, I was not even checking the quantity and I was not checking the uh, specifications at all. <coughs> so the point is you don't have to do the specification for A, for C, the same C, you don't have to look at that level of quality. <coughs> okay, so C was accepted without problem. Some people actually came and told me, it's only eight, is it okay? Shoot that told me that, okay? <laughs> when I it was only eight, I had to reject it. But if you just gave it to me, it was accepted without problem. The product also depends on the marketing manager, yeah? Again, marketing manager, yes. Yeah, also really, yeah. <laughs> yes. And she does the product for my equipment. Yes, okay. Okay, so any other points that you wish to make about what what do you think was your, your sequence, what happened in your group? Group number one. I noticed that you all had the same level of quality for all the products, which is not required because manufacturing quality must be related to the price. And so you all have the same level of quality for A, B, and C, okay, which is not required. That's one of the things that you will notice. The group number three, any any issues there? We, we spent a lot of time on the fabrication because we were looking for the quality. Yes, and once we got it, then we have the, we, we have the same quality. Yes. So then we, we, we did it. And because we we cut one paper and we do all the paper in the same way and we just cut it and we just bring the punching and check it. So for, for the third for the third quality, quality. we were in rush and we did <laughs> we, we, we did in seconds. Okay, so that is that is the uh, issue of you don't have to have the same quality for each of the products. <coughs> now, uh, if group number four, you got us any issue that you want to discuss? <laughs> Actually, from the product design and except the understanding of the product was not right. Correct. That was the fact. Yes. And then uh, yeah. my time consumption was going in that. Yes. And then uh, to add to the humor, yes. we, we were working on a strategy before product B. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. They, they had a misunderstanding about the number of pages, 
I wanted to develop a number of products meant and all that. <coughs> okay, so there was an issue over the design. And the last group. I, I think the success of us that we organized the work, there was a teamwork. Uh, the, the drawback with us was uh, uh, the design for the first product wasn't correct because we didn't see the sample. So when we saw the sample, we recognized that we need to change it. This takes time from us. But uh, I think we are in the mass product. We are very well because with, with C, we produced two batches twice. So I think if we concentrate from the beginning and see product, we will be in the top by the mass product, not the quality. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 This one is group four. And group two has been uh, subcontracted sub the work to group four. Uh, but, but group four had only produced. Uh, no, what no. I said, they have subcontracted. Yes. And, and they have taken the credit. They have taken credit. So what? But group four had given it for free. That oh. only we can win on the Okay, so let's look at it. The most important thing that you notice is design. Okay. And in the case of the design, what was interesting was for the designer, okay, especially group four designers should be set and set on some other work. Okay. Uh, the designers should at least open and see where the staple is. They could the designer, sorry, I could pick on you, but you didn't know where the staple was. Right? And also notice that the measures are from the end of the board, not the middle of the board. Now normally when we have a measurement, you specifically you take it from the middle of the hole, but purposely I did it from the end of the hole. That's why some of the holes are not aligned when you are getting the final product. Now that is not unusual. If you take America for instance, they are still on feet and inches and miles rather than kilometers and meters. Okay, so if they can't even get that right, you can imagine how certain industrial specifications, there is a but they say lost in the translation between one type of measure and the other. So the measures are not standard. And you can see if you get the design right, the problem follows through right on. Importance of the design, getting right on the first place. You can see group four and five mentioned that as one of their issues in their production. Factory layout, now in this case, the layout was simple because they had round tables. Okay, but in some places when I paint in sort of MBA theaters, then you have a problem of how to how to organize yourself to make it easy for you to look at the product. So you have to look at product layout. Factory layout, sorry. Now comes the stapler. Now the stapler was what we call a general purpose machine. That is a machine that can do sort of a number of different products. But the problem is that it was not big enough to do product B. Product B was designed in such a way that your general purpose stapler was not enough to do this whole, the, the staples, without folding a piece of paper. Okay, so what is the solution to that? Anyone got a solution? How to do it without folding the paper? Yeah, you have to do this uh, surface uh, on the table. Okay, uh, now for those things that love to Ramada, they will be pretty upset <laughs> if you like the table. But other people actually use the ruler, okay, to do the statement. They open it out, use the ruler. But you know, in, when I go and play this game in Hong Kong and China, they are so fast, immediately they ignore the stapler. Stapler, take the staple, break it up, and do hand insertion. Simple. Okay. Now you only think of it, right? But they get it like this. Okay. Hand insertion. You did the same way. Okay, so one group has done it, and then you don't get the fold. But Chinese has high quality and low quality. Okay, so you can see general purpose machines may not be good enough for special purpose jobs. Lack of capital. Now, why didn't you all? I saw a lot of managers sitting around and observing when they could have easily bought another hole puncher and started punching holes. But you all simply did not want to buy any more assets. Okay, that was a bit unusual. Quantity discounts. You see that I, actually this group, as, as uh, all five groups are pretty good, you are very careful about your purchases. You have only bought a few raw materials and uh, even though without a discount, that is actually not a bad thing because you don't have extra scrap paper very much in your, on your table. 
some people buy you know, 30, 40 sheets within the discount, but then they have raw material, they can get paper, and they don't do production. Okay, so you've got to think about just in time purchasing versus quantity discounts. <coughs> raw material, so can we flip this way around? You can see that the raw material uh, of the with products that I rejected, especially those who came in the product, maybe the staple in the wrong place and had cut, cut and folded things, those people could, of course, use it for recycling to do product C. Anyone did that? If your rejected product A, recycle it, as you can see, then you can immediately see that that was a possibility. Okay. Understanding of customer perceptions are different levels of quality. So you can now see what I meant by medium quality, high quality, low quality. Okay. So it's quality is a customer perception, something that we will talk about when we are looking at quality. And it's important for you to understand. The moment the secret has put out that the customer uh, was accepting products without looking, then the market will react accordingly. Okay, now another one. You can see about waiting time. Some of you have brought product A or even product C before the full batch was done. You can see the waiting time issue there. You probably spoiled the full batch if you're not being completed. Okay, and you have got a good idea of that. Cost of reworks. Okay, now this is something that is rejected or your inspector rejects it. And it can be reworked. So if the, now one group had all 10 products, with one, two staples. They put everything into one, they thought that was the product. So if that meant you take a staple out, break it up into 10 different products, and re-staple. So that can be a rework. But if the hole is in the wrong place, or the paper is cut, you cannot rework it. You can either make product C, or it is going as scrap, which is what you find on your table. Okay, let's see, scrap issue. Inspection online. Did your group have an inspector, by the way, anyone? No one has inspected. I think that's an important one. Okay, no inspection online. Just allow the market to decide. Okay, worker specialization. I noted that some people just cannot cut or make a staple. Their children will be better, right? <laughs> okay, so they need to be retrained. Okay, especially re worker retraining in terms of design. Okay, now you saw the customer demand pressure, the, the prices are going up, the, the, there was a limited time in the market close, so you can see that there were those delivery schedules and pressure was in this game. You remember this game for a long time, and the really get it, they got to spend a hundred pieces of paper. So there was different competitive pressure because one person can corner the whole market. And finally, keep your eye on the financials. Now I purposely, I you turn the thing around, I purposely got uh, Shakib to put an extra raw material cost for them. They picked it up. Before the game was over, they said, hey, what is that raw material? We didn't buy that. Our, our efficiency is we need to calculate it differently. And then this group, I asked Shakib to not record something, but the marketing person always looked carefully to see if the recording was done before she went back to the group. So this is all very good. Keep your eye on the financials. Okay? And uh, later on, of course, this proves that an auditor to check the numbers as well. <laughs> okay. So you can see that some of you I notice are giving you market information, new products are coming, prices are going up, you all were not bothering at all. You were importing cutting and stage. Okay? This is called the the egg, the middle of the egg problem. Okay? You all were concentrating on the yellow of the egg so much, the whole level of the whole everything, you forgot the white outside, okay? And this can often happen where you ignore the environment because you're just so much keen on, on the yellow part of the area. Okay, so be careful about that. Keep your eye on the finances, keep your eye on the market. Okay, so if you still, we are still on topic two. Uh, after simulation game, that's the total quality management part of the uh, topic. Now you will see that very many of the uh, concepts that we have, we are going to discuss, we have already covered in the simulation game. So 
we're going to look at the control of quality. Remember that we're talking about the control framework in most of the topics I'm introduced when we talk about the control framework, which is essentially where cost management is. <coughs> quality is not a property that has an absolute meaning. It is related to function. The function that you want uh, for a pair of shoes to walk on the beach is not the same as you would want for a dress shoe to go for an exclusive wedding or a dinner. It is related to the function for which it is used. It is also related to changing customer perception. So what was considered high quality one year may not be maybe unacceptable the next year. So customer perception of what is good quality <coughs> is also changing. Now quality has two distinct but interrelated aspects. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, there's the quality of design, the degree of achievement of the design itself. So for example, this particular thing that I showed you, does it do what it is supposed to do, the design? Is it supposed to do a certain function? Does it do it? But then there is also the quality of conformance. That is, has the manufacturing process made it to the expectation of what was required in the design? Okay, so now in the 19, <coughs> in the 1990s, the Jaguar car was excellently designed. The excellently designed car, but it was not manufactured with good precision, and therefore half the time it was breaking down. So there is a difference between what the design is and if you can make it according to the design, which is the faithfulness, which is the product agrees with the design. Now, from a finance point of view, the amount of design quality should follow this particular graph. Now you can see from the example I gave you earlier about group number one, they made the quality of product C the same level of quality in the manufacturing process as product B, which is not required. So you can see with increasing precision in your production process, of course, the Manufacturing costs would increase as you have more and more quality control, more and more inspections, more and more better quality raw materials, that will increase. And once you come up to the 100% level of, level of precision, your quality costs increase significantly. At the same time, how much you can get for the product? Of course, as you increase quality, the price you can charge is going to be more, but after a certain point, no matter how good the quality is, how good your product C was, you're not going to get any more money for it. Okay, so there is a theoretical distance between the manufacturing co cost for the level of quality and the price that you can get. So ideally, you'd want the maximum distance, so that's theory. In practice, you would want to be in that vicinity. This is called in America the sweet spot, the spot that you want to be, where your quality level and your price is the health of that maximum distance. How can we the luxury? Yeah, even the, you're right. The luxury cars, you will see, has a significant amount of precision and you can charge a lot for it. But even luxury cars, even your Rolls Royce and your Bentleys, after a certain point, okay, you're not going to get more price for it. Okay. So now there are some products where you really cannot have this distance. For example, a simple thing called the O-ring that was used in the space shuttle. They actually put a tender out for it, NASA, and they got the product with the lowest tender price. The lowest tender price was the lowest quality, and what happened? Gas was exit to the O-ring and the whole space shuttle exploded. So some things, you cannot do this quality cost exercise, you cannot allow it to fail. But consumer products, you can have this, this variation. Okay. Well, the problem with ISO is, as some of you have gone through this exercise, ISO is simply a method to see if your records are kept properly. Doesn't tell you if the product is actually good quality. Have you maintained the inspection? Have you recorded it? Have you done this? Have you done that? If you do all those things, the expectation is that your quality will be better. Okay? But it never actually looks at the product itself, it's the processors of yeah. getting the certification. Okay. okay, so ISO certified, up to a certain point you can accept it. 
there's going to be in itself necessarily all the time of high quality product. Yeah, for marketing the product, they are paying for the product. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Not only ISO, it is other certifications. Yes, yes. At the moment, the big debate in Sri Lanka, which I'll talk about later, is this halal certification. Okay? Uh, we have having halal certification in Sri Lanka for even pork. Halal pork. <laughs> halal shoes. Halal uh, slippers. Okay? So, it's a big debate for that and other reasons. Okay, so, this certification has gone crazy. Okay. okay. Now, quality cost categories. There are some categories that you would have, and if you are really serious about quality, you should actually have this in your chart of account. That is in your legacy system, similar to you have a separate account for rent or salaries, you should have these areas or subcategories for quality costs. First of all, prevention, job training, quality circles, things that you would do to prevent a problem from happening. Then there is the conformance cost. This is to make sure the product conforms to specification, inspection, testing. So none of you, unfortunately, in this group had a quality inspector or a tester. You simply brought the product to the market. But in company, there will be that category. So any salary paid to the inspector should go on the conformance cost. <coughs> then there is failure. A failure is two components. If it fails before you put it to the customer, that's called internal failure. So it goes as a rework or a GLUs. Okay. But if it is going out to the market and there's an external failure, then you have customer complaints and to make it good under warranties. So you can see that anything that you do to do with warranty in your chart of account should go under external cost of failure. Anything to do with rework should go under internal cost of failure. So this is where you're serious about quality, you'll be having these quality cost categories. <coughs> now along with quality, you can see that there is this capability of the process of precision really. You will see that as you have more and more training, more and more inspection, your failure cost, both internal and external failure, dramatically falls. Okay, initially you can see huge fall there because you're doing more things here. Of course, as you are going to get very high levels of capability, cost will go up again, but it is that initial drop that is very important in the area of quality. Okay. Now, along with quality comes this concept of reliability. <coughs> Often the two are confused. What we think is good quality is actually reliability. What is the distinction between quality and reliability? Quality is fitness for purpose. Reliability is the ability to continue to function to an acceptable lip quality standard and forms part of the judgment made with regard to the quality of the product. So this particular wireless mouse again, it does its job. It puts the things back and forward. It has the laser pointer. But how long can I go on clicking this until it doesn't move the spring waves way or the laser pointer burns out? How long? That is reliability. Okay? So now the Japanese cars is a good example of this. Not the current Japanese cars, but after World War II, which finished in 1947, the Japan was the enemy of the United States. But under the Marshall Plan, they were allowed to sell their products into the US. And so the initial Toyotas and Datsuns that came to the US were the first uh, Datsun was the now the Sun. <coughs> and the Toyota was called Toyo Toyopet, the, the car. They were, you know, so cheap extremely cheap because they were financed by the Ministry of Industry and Trade in Japan. Okay, they were very cheap. Americans were very suspicious. The Japanese were, first of all, the enemy during the war. Secondly, that they were never known for making good cars in the first place. Even their toys broke. But it was so cheap that the Americans decided, let us buy this more or less like a disposable car. We can buy one a year, okay, rather than buying an American car. So they bought the Japanese cars, more or less as a second car, run around like a disposable razor, a disposable car. But what happened? Every winter, the American car didn't start, the Japanese car started. Okay? That was reliability. Okay? So slowly, 
the perception was there that the Japanese are good politicals. It was not quality that gave them the reputation, it was reliability. It never, it always started. Okay. So another good product for that, this is the AK-47. Okay. The Kaiushika 47, made in 1947, mind you. It's the gun of choice of all the terrorists and the army these days. Why is that? Because no matter if you are underwater, in mud, wherever, it keeps on hard. Okay? It is reliability that makes it the preferred product of many terrorists and, of course, even some armies. Okay? I had a person who was using it. He said it is very hot. Okay? After you fire a couple of rounds, but it, it fires no matter what. Okay? No matter where it has been, it still fires. So that is reliability. Okay, methods of attempting to assure reliability. Use proven designs. Use a design that has been proven that it can last a distance. Use the simplest possible design. All these new tangled things may actually reduce reliability. Okay, take for example, Lebanon. Anyone here from Lebanon? Okay, I mean, we run the CMA program, but we used to run it in Lebanon till recent problems. Okay, but if you, anyone who knows Lebanon will know that the most popular car in Lebanon is the Mercedes-Benz car. But the Mercedes-Benz, not of the new Mercedes-Benz, is the ninth of, up to about the 1994 Mercedes-Benz. Why? Because Lebanon still had major holes on the roads after their civil war, which carried me to repair. And the Lebanese drivers are anyway crazy. Okay, if you go to Lebanon and you're driving in a main road fast, you've got to be careful because some guy comes to a perfectly stationary halt to go and do something in the middle of the main road. So you think the car is moving when it's actually stationary. But be very careful. But why Mercedes-Benz? Because it's the only car, not even BMW, can take those potholes. Okay, it's a sturdiest car. In any, any little corner shop, you can get Mercedes-Benz spare parts made in Lebanon. Okay, now, that is because they don't use any electronics. The cars that are very popular there have no electronics. In today's cars with electronics, you know that the reliability sometimes is a bit suspect. Okay. So it's simple possible design. Use components of known or likely high probability of survival. <coughs> Employ redundant parts. Okay, now there was once when the computers were, early computers were so unreliable that there was a company called Tandem that actually make two computers in one. So one gave up, the other one took over. Okay, so that was redundant parts. Designed to fail safe. So if you're, you go into an elevator, a lift, you hope that if the cable breaks, that somehow the braking system will stop the elevator from falling. So designed to fail safe. These days, many cars have the crawl home option. Okay, if something goes radically wrong, it's still given enough backup systems to crawl home, okay, without being stranded on the road. And use proven manufacturing methods. So these are all things to assure reliability, the ability to perform for a long period of time. So what's the difference between a no-name computer and say a branded product like Philip Packard? It's simply that it does the same job, but if you did, a Packard would have components that are known to last longer okay, than a no name brand. Okay, now, link with reliability is this curve called the bathtub curve. Obviously, it's called the bathtub curve because it looks like a bathtub. Now, this curve has actually saved me money. I'll show you how. What it says is that over time, if something is going to fail, it's going to fail early. Okay. So that is why many companies do give you warranties for this period, or they even do testing <coughs> before they send the product out. So bulb manufacturers will test a batch of bulbs to see if it lasts long, if it's acceptable, then it's sent out. Okay? I was uh, at the Holden, that is the General Motors factory in Australia. They got an order for their engines from Opel in Germany. You go into the Holden factory, you can see the sound of engines. You see the engines are on a block of wood, and they're running and they run 1,000 kilometers on a block of wood before they ship to Germany as new engines. So that is this burning 
Now, if it survives this, it's likely going to be have a very long, useful life where the failure rate is quite low. And then, of course, old age comes in and it starts changing. So, in countries like Australia, if one part of your dishwasher or your washing machine gives up, get rid of it because very soon everything is going to fail. Of course, if you are in India or Sri Lanka, you try to do repairs of that because you can't afford a new one. But otherwise, you must always just dispose of it because it's, it's the end of its life. Okay, so how does has this saved me money? I personally, and I don't scold me if something happens to you, but I personally do not take extended warranty. The only time I've taken extended warranty is when the new digital cameras came, but now even that I don't take. Because if it has passed the warranty period and have been tested, most likely I'll never be going to use the extended warranty. And manufacturers know that. They give you the extended warranty because they know they won't have to come good on it. Okay? So it's a waste of money. Of course, they will never give you an extended warranty that's going to go into this part. Okay? So they will tell things like five years or 50,000 kilometers. Okay, five years, 100,000 or 20 years and 100,000. So they limit it in some way. It is not the age, it's the number of kilometers that you do. Yes, so they won't allow you warranty beyond a certain point. Okay, so that's the bad stuff. Now some research has been done regarding quality, especially from a point of view of accounting. Quality is often measured as a reduction in total quality cost. As accounting measures are perceived as objective, reliable and credible by other organization members, management accounts have been asked to measure such costs. Research has been done in this area, and it says that only about a third of companies today say that they specifically measure quality costs regularly. Now that is a very poor number because that means two thirds who are in manufacturing against competition are not measuring quality costs. Industry is forced to confront strong foreign competition, measure quality more often. Factors that contribute to a financial controller's department measuring quality in which the management account will be top management commitment to improving quality. That has to be there. If you don't have top management commitment, then you won't find people measuring this and the controller being involved. Levels of available resources to conduct a special studies. How much of resources are given to conduct special studies regarding quality. Now, we're going to do a case study very soon. We are going to look at a special study that has been done regarding quality. Extent of the controller department involvement in quality team projects. How often the controller asks to join the team? Often these quality cost people, quality teams are engineers. In the manufacturing flow, they don't want to talk to accounting. They say we know more accounting than you. We are from a maths background, we know more accounting than you guys. Then they do some crazy allocations. Frequency of communication with quality function personnel and the level of top kinds of reliance on formal cost reduction programs. So, how, what, what is the pressure for you to reduce costs? That will also mean more involvement by the financial control department. But the main thing is this top management commitment. Okay, so now let's look at the case study clean shaven. 